All right. So welcome to uh, Thursday. Welcome to it's Thursday, right? Yeah, Thursday. Um, and I'm super excited here to have um, Andreas and Anna uh, to present their work um, and and their their ideas. Uh, when I was trying to figure out what this course should be about, uh, as as everyone's first step, I did a bunch of web searching. <laughs> And then Andreas's name popped up and I was like, wow, this guy is amazing. He has connections to medicine. He has had went through two PhDs. He's doing explainability. Oh, wait, he's also affiliated with Amy and the University of Alberta. So that was a very, very happy uh, circumstance. Um, unfortunately, because of, of COVID, he hasn't been able to be in Edmonton recently at all. Um, but we're lucky enough to have him today with us in person. And we do have... Um, uh, if there are problems, Andreas has uh, recorded a, um, a YouTube version that we can switch to if we need to, uh, but he would like to give a live talk, while Anna will likely give, uh, will look at her recorded talk. So we have um, two talks to cover, but please um, interrupt with questions, unmute yourself, drop, drop comments in Discord, um, whatever, whatever is best for you. But with that, I'd like to hand it over. Yeah, Matt, thank you. So welcome students or however I should call you uh, to this explainable AI of course 656. And uh, thanks for uh, to Matt Taylor for the kind invitation. Yeah, as he said, my name is Andreas Holzinger. And for the past 10 years, I'm working together with my group and I see Anna here uh, in front of me. So I'm working together with my group on a synergistic approach of human-centered AI to put the human in control of AI and to align it with human values such as privacy, security, safety. This is very important. And Anna Saranti is my PhD stu student, uh, is doing her doctoral thesis in explainable AI in the first Austrian explainable AI project founded by the Austrian Science Foundation, which is hard to get. So we have 10% acceptance rate. This is similar to NSF or so. And she will provide you the practical part with an assignment in Python. So let's take a brief look what I have planned for you in the course. So the schedule I have learned from Matt uh, is 30 minutes lecture, 30 minutes practice, and 20 minutes question and answering. So what will you hear in this uh, first 30 minutes? So I will rather speak on a top level approach. So uh, about um, performance in uh, current performance in medical AI. Uh, then we will see a little bit why the human in the loop may be beneficial. And then I will present you briefly, very briefly, some cool methods of explainable AI. And we will focus on one of it. And Anna will show you how cool this method is. And we will work practically on it. And uh, then I will come automatically to ground truth, because this is so important. And I will finish with um, going beyond explainable AI. So this is uh, uh, my baby towards causability. So let's start. So with the first, with a look at current best practice examples, success example of current state of the art, machine learning, artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning is, is a, a much better term. So this is maybe the most famous paper. This is, uh, this has meanwhile, I think over 4,000 plus citations. And I think whilst I'm talking with Matt uh, and we drink beer together, uh, they, they, they people get citations. So what did they do? So basically, uh, they classified skin lesions. They used a single CNN here in Inception V3, and they trained it end to end from these dermatological images directly with disease labels as input, and they classified it. And the results are interesting with 92%. It is very, very good classification performance. And this is interestingly on par with human dermatologists. So this is very, very exciting that you see really that um, uh, it's an amazing result. And I, when this paper came out, I have a very good friend who is a dermatologist and um, I asked him, look at this cool, uh, what, do they do, what do you say? And he said, really, very good. So, but the question remains open, why? Why do they come to such a result? Okay, 
Next example, this is a recent work from the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto uh, on histopathology. And um, this is very interesting. They applied uh, a CNN to a repository of 840,000 histopathological image tiles, which you can see here. And they learned the representations into this 512 dimensional feature vector. And the novelty here is really amazing. They compared it with human constructs. So uh, the, really the guys showed that machine generated features correlate with certain morphological constructs and with ontological relationships generated by humans, by human doctors. And I will come back to this later to show you how a pathologist make a diagnosis and we can learn a lot out of it. Yeah, so why is this important for us now? Because highlighting such overlaps um, between human thinking and, uh, and let's say uh, in brackets machine thinking, so in quotation marks, uh, this can contribute to what is currently a top issue in machine learning, namely to eliminate bias and improve the algorithms, but most of all make these results retraceable and uh, explainable in order to meet the accountability in medical AI. And of course, I'm proud that they reference to my paper. So this is a nature paper referencing to our paper. And uh, this is our work on causability, which I will then discuss later on. Okay, so what are our main research interests, uh, re research uh, questions in our group? So, um, this is um, maybe a little bit high level. So what do we want to help the international research community? So first of all, uh, why can AI solve some tasks better than humans? This is a, a very high level question. But then why does the AI achieve such results? And here I must already emphasize that in the medical domain, which is our field, many, many diverse data contribute to one single result. This is very important and I will come back to that later on. And now this is immediately now the third question that uh, what if I now replace, disturb, remove input data or more technically, as I stated it here, what if the input data changes counterfactually? So I, in short, the question, what do we need to make AI even more successful? In short, robustness and interpretability. And here a dramatic example from medical AI. So everybody knows the famous example from Iron Goodfellow with the panda who turned into a gibbon. And this is a similar real life example, real world example from the medical domain. So here again, you have a dermatological image, a thermoscopic image of a benign nebus. And the diagnostic probability of this is, uh, let's say, 99% benign. Now you add a little bit of a noise, a slight perturbation, which is not visible to the human eye, generated by a very common adversarial attack technique. So this can be done by a bachelor student. And now this is traumatic. You get a completely new result. And this is now with 97% malignant. So it is completely different. And we don't know why you cannot retrace, you cannot explain why you had these wrong decisions. So you see robustness is closely related to generalize. And usually robustness is a ubiquitous feature of biological systems. And uh, Matt Taylor is an excellent example. He is now robust to make this, to run this course. And he is uh, running this and maintains this despite of external and internal perturbations, okay? I will sh uh, show you later on how we can make um, sometimes, not always, of the human robustness. Okay, so uh, let me now show you a machine learning one on one slide, which I show my students at the very, very beginning. But you will see that this is a really important slide and you will quickly realize that these are maybe the grand challenges for us. So first we have to learn from data, of course, yeah. And uh, the first, this is the first challenge, but often we do not have this big data in the medical domain. And most of all, 
the quality of the data is a big issue. So we need to learn from often from few data and we need high quality data, but often we do not have this, okay? So then we have to extract knowledge. Then we have to generalize and you know, generalizing is a general scientific quest. So this is uh, to form abstract general concepts as a basic uh, basis for deductive inferences. And this is a general scientific principle going back to an Austrian researcher, Karl Popper. And uh, we always in the medical domain have to fight the curse of dimensionality. So this is also uh, a very uh, important topic. And then we have to disentangle. And now uh, this is contrary to what Joshua Benji is always saying from Montreal. Uh, he, I would emphasize that we have to disentangle the independent explanatory factors of the data because um, this is in the medical domain because the dependent factors cannot always be disentangled. And that means ultimately that we need this causal understanding in the context of the application domain. And in the medical domain, this is an old field, this is called etiology. This is the old science of the study of causation, for example, the cause of a disease, for example, some symptom Y is shortness of breath, and the cause is then this COVID-19 pandemic, which now uh, leads us to such sessions as we are here. So I would like to prefer now standing with you, looking you into the eyes and, and, and afterwards having a drink together and so on. Okay, be it as it may, as Shakespeare always said. So why is now a human in the loop sometimes beneficial? And I emphasize sometimes because it's not always, uh, because if you, if you really go back and, and think back in the early beginning of AI, these uh, AI engineers wrote programs to imitate this intelligence beha behavior, but this was completely handcrafted with, and they were neither robust nor general. And so AI shifted to the development of this uh, uh, very successful statistical probabilistic learning, learning algorithms. So going back to uh, Hinton and all and so on. But the problem is now that they become so, so um, complex that they are now considered as a kind of black box. So this is the black box there for this opaque behavior. And uh, yeah, and we call model free stochastic methods uh, these black boxes. Um, they are nonlinear, they are high dimensional, they are increasingly intransparent uh, and non understandable for the human, and therefore lacking the generalization and, of course, ground truth, which I will come back later. So, the idea now is to put a human in the loop. Now, what should the human do? Uh, the human can bring in conception knowledge. For example, the human has some context understanding, some experience, and this is very important to, to combine now these statistical approaches with the conceptual knowledge from the human. Yeah, and how do human, uh, humans generalize from a few examples? Uh, so sometimes, not always, they are able to understand the context they can also make inferences, you know that from little noisy incomplete data sets, they can learn relevant representations and they have what we say causal reasoning. Yeah, and what is now problematic with these most successful methods as we have seen in the beginning. So there's no way a certain task are beyond human level and there's no debate that AI will make its way into medicine, but we have a problem now that the most successful approaches are so complex that it is difficult yet impossible to retrace, to understand and to interpret how a certain decision has been made. And a couple of years ago, nobody cared. I had uh, once a talk at Carnegie Mellon and the people said, Andreas, we are not interested in your human in the loop approach because we want to do it automatically. 
Press a button, wait for the results. That is our goal. And I understand that this is true, for example, for autonomous driving, but in the medical domain, you have this responsibility. And now in the European Union, we have a general right for explanation. And please do not misunderstand. It does, this does not mean that you have to explain everything in uh, just in time. This means that if something happens, then you have to give the medical doctor who is still in command and responsible, you have to give him a chance at least to retrace and to have a chance to explain why a certain machine decision has been made. Okay, so what are now interpretable models versus interpreting models? So we speak of anti-hoc models, for example. So this is the class box approach. So regression naive based decision trees, they are by nature theoretically um, explainable, interpretable, uh, but the graph can also be very large. So it can be difficult. On the other side, we have these black box models. And for these black box models, we need some explainable AI methods. These are called this interpreting black box model post hoc. And now the, X, the XI, so XI is short for explainable AI, the XI community is a lively community and they have developed quite a number of very useful techniques. And um, here I have to point out, so we have uh, the model, you see the model M, and now we need the explainable model to interpret this model, but we still have the open question, how do we make, or how can we make a kind of a human AI interface, which now allows a human domain expert um, to ask this question, to ask for counterfactual. So this is still an open question here. Yeah, how can we make such uh, explainable methods? The simplest way is to use gradients. So the simplest method is to start function-based. So a multivariate generalization of the derivative, for example. Uh, sensitivity analysis, we perturb a model, look how robust the system responds. Uh, this measures local effects, but we often need global effects. Then uh, there is this method of simple Taylor expansion. So this is one approach of decomposition. That means you separate the computations into a set of localized neurons and then recombine it similar as in error backpropagation. So mathematically, this is nothing else than chain rule for derivatives. And this goes back to Taylor series and they were introduced by Brooke Taylor in 1715 and Brooke Taylor lived in Edmonton in Middlesex, England. So in, this is the Edmonton in good old Europe. And yeah, and this can you, you can now combine with decomposition methods. So decomposition breakdown in smaller parts, more understandable parts, highlight what features contributed to the result. This can, you can do pixel wise or layer wise, and you can use the Taylor decomposition and uh, among other popular methods is excitation backpropagation, for example. So this is inspired by the visual attention process. And um, this is a concept of contrastive attention to produce these top-down uh, attention maps via probabilistic winner-take-it-all process, for example. Then optimization uh, techniques, the famous Lime or Beta or SmoothGrad. And uh, then you can make deconvolutions. These are the oldest methods. They go back to Rob Fergus and Matt Saylor from 2014. So this is also a very interesting method. And then a recent method is qualitative testing with concept activation vectors decaf. Okay, let us focus just for the time uh, uh, left uh, on one single method and we will then do the practically on this. So this is layer-wise relevance propagation. So this is explanation via decomposition. So the core idea is to compute a relevance core R sub D of X for each input X in the dimension of D. And the goal is to find out how much does a pixel contribute to a classification result. This is then done layer by layer, hence the name layer wise relevance. So the simplest principle is to look how much to change 
in each pixel affect a result. This can be calculated from the partial derivatives. So to make it applicable, of course, you have to feed in the pixels of a, an effect as of an image. Here, for example, the features. You feed it in into the network, and then you back kind of back propagate it here, therefore the name layer wise relevance propagation. So you get a relevance core and you look uh, what, con what contributed to the classification result here, for example, the cat, which makes a cat the cat. And you can highlight this in a heat map, for example, and then you see that obviously these whiskers from this uh, cat makes or contributes mo most to being a cat to the classification result cat. So this is um, a, a very interesting method how you can look what contributed most to the result that it is a classification like that. Okay, now, uh, as I have already mentioned in the medical domain, we do not have only pixel based data such as images, a lot of data can be represented as a graph. And look at these proteins. Proteins are the building blocks of life. And uh, you can easily form out of these uh, proteins uh, sequence graphs, so secondary structures, and the graph out of this. And then you can do everything uh, what uh, graph theory offers. And this is a lot. So you have a graph consisting of edges and nodes. The, vertices are the nodes, the edges are called also links. And the big advantage is also that you can include time. And here you have the input graph, for example, and then Schnacke et al, the colleagues from TU Berlin, they recently developed a method which applies layer-wise relevance propagation on such graphs. And this is really a cool, uh, really cool work because you can find out then what uh, the relevant walks, so really the relevance of the walks which contributed to a result. And uh, this can be done on the very, the currently very, very popular, um, uh, these uh, um, networks, these GNNs, graph neural networks. Then you do the same, you apply Taylor expansion, for example. And finally, you get a reverse back propagation here, which identifies your path. And you can then explain how and retrace what contributes to a result. And this is particularly important in the medical domain. But now ground truths. This is very important because um, this is um, missing in the medical domain most of the time. And how to, and now I came to this, what I promised to show you how do human pathologists make a diagnosis. So they, for example, uh, observe such images. And at first they do only describe such images. So for example, they use special terms. They speak about objects, cells, architecture. For example, this here is a portal field. Here, cells are closer and smaller and closer together here. And then in the second part of their work, they interpret it. So they interpret their observation by using their implicit knowledge. For example, here, cells are smaller and closer together. It is a tumor, but it can also be an inflammation. That means we need this contextual understanding. This goes far beyond of what we have seen, what an explainable method can do. And here is important that various different modalities contribute to a single result. The problem is missing grounds too. This was the motivation for developing um, a exp explanation environment, which we have uh, provided. And, uh, but before that, let us quickly hear ground truth because this is so important. Uh, and I'm looking at the time. I think I have uh, 10 minutes left. Is this correct, Matt? And of course, my phone turned off. You have eight and a half minutes left. Super, thanks. I will stay in time. So very good. So roughly information provided by direct observation. This is called empirical evidence in contrast to information provided by inference. And just for you uh, as a, let's say a rehearsal, 
empirical evidence is information acquired by observation or by experimentation in order to verify the truth. This is this fit, the mapping to the reality, or to falsif falsify, this is the non-fit to reality. And then we have this empirical inference, that means you draw conclusions from empirical data, observations, measurements, and so on. And then, of course, the causal inference, that means drawing conclusions about the causal connection. Okay, you know, Reichenbach, there is no correlation without causation, and uh, this is our leading principle. So let us summarize, fact, medical AI is currently extremely successful. We reach even human level performance. However, in the real world, we are facing three challenges where we want to contribute with our Kandinsky patterns, which I show you later. Ground truth is not always well defined, especially in making a medical diagnosis. Although human scientific models are often based on understanding causal mechanisms, today's the most successful examples, as I have shown before, are based on correlation or related concepts in the graphs, for example, of similarity and distance. Yeah, and this is just a side note why we have named our experimental environment, uh, exploration environment, Kandinsky patterns, named after Vasily Kandinsky. This was a Russian painter because he analyzed geometrical elements which make up every painting, as you can see here, the point, for example, the circle and the line and so on. And he did not analyze it from physics, but from the point of view of the inner effect to the observer from psychology. So he described that there are basic forms and this is very, very interesting. And a similar work was then done by Hubel and Wiesel. And all this inspired finally the deep learning people around Jeffrey Hinton et al. And this was then the, the, the fundamentals for what is now called deep learning. So you can play around with our Kandinsky patterns. In short, they are mathematically describable, simple, self-contained, therefore controllable test data sets for the development, for the validation and training of explainability in artificial intelligence. And um, yeah, this is open. This We call it a Swiss knife for the study of explainable AI. You find all the information about our exploration environment in our GitHub repo. Okay, so just one example here. You have a true statement. The cells are smaller and closer together. It's a tumor. Then here a false pattern, complete random. And then the counterfactual, that is the cells are slightly bigger. And then you can ask what happens if the cells are slightly bigger. And this enables us to study causality in the sense of Judea Pearl, so the art of science and of cause and effect. And we have developed this further. We introduced causability as the measurable extent to which an explanation received from such an explainable AI technique by a heat map, for example. And this should then achieve a specified level of causal understanding on the human side. So this is very, very important that this is the mapping between the explainable AI technique and the human mind, so to say. And this allows us then uh, the, to measure the quality of explanations. And we have together with a colleague from Canada uh, developed a systems causability scale. Yeah, and in short, and then I'm uh, done. So I have uh, approximately five minutes left. So I come quickly to the end. So when is an explanation good? Obviously when it was completely understood by the recipient, but this is not easy as we all know. And um, therefore let us start uh, with the statement. So a statement can be done here either by a human S sub H or a machine S sub M. And this is a function of R K and C, where we define R is the representation of an unknown or unobserved fact, U subscript E, related to the entity. This is the unknown, or we call it unknown. Yeah? And uh, K, or K is then the pre-existing, the prior knowledge, which is for a machine embedded in the algorithm. Remember this LRP, or made up by a human explicit implicit or tacit knowledge. So this is the human in the loop then. 
And C is the runtime environment, so the technical runtime environment. And for humans, this is our physical contextual environment. The context within the decision was made. So we call this the pragmatic dimension. So for details, please read the paper. What is the essence out of here? And the goal is now uh, to measure here whether and to what extent the statement is congruent with the ground truth and the explanation of the statement. So we map here the M subscript M or M subscript H. So we map both the model from the machine and the model from the human. So for more details, please refer to the paper. And now I come to the conclusion and I'm happy to stay in time. So let me conclude. Uh, what we need in the future is a kind of multi-model explainability. And please excuse my bad English pronunciation, model. I mean here not model, I mean model, modal, comes from modality, not from model. Yeah. So multi-model uh, explainability and multi-model causability. So this means to enable an expert not only to ask questions, but also to evaluate the quality of explanations received from an explainable AI method. And this is important because remember in medicine, many different modalities contribute to one single result. And one goal is to provide human AI interfaces which enable a domain expert to ask questions of why and what if counterfactual questions. And I have uh, for the goodbye, goodbye words, uh, this guy would like to say thank you very much for your kind attention. And now uh, I lead over to the second part. Uh, with the practical part. And after this practical part, I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you for, very much. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is exactly the material I wish I had about a year and a half ago when I started getting into explainability. Um, so there, there are some questions in Discord, uh, which um, we could, uh, you could answer in text if you wanted, but we can also talk about those after the video. So let me now try to share my screen and you'll need to yell at me if this doesn't work because I will no okay. longer be able to see you. Welcome students of the University of Alberta in Edmonton in Canada. I am Anna Sarante and together with Professor Andreas Holziger, I will present the details of the practical part of the Explainable AI lecture. I will talk about how can we explain neural networks and their predictions with layer-wise relevance propagation. This is a method that is invented and developed by the group of Klaus Robert Müller at the Technical University of Berlin. Uh, I personally, I am employed by the Medical University of Graz. I am not part of the University of Alberta and I've just finished my first year in, of my PhD studies that are supervised by Professor Holziger and have myself still many things to learn. The outline of my presentation today will contain the introduction and will go into the feed-forward neural network architecture, which is the most simple and first architectures that uh, were developed. For those of you who don't know, there will be books and literature provided by in the end of this video. For those that already know the details and training and bar propagation are known, you can feel free to repeat or just skip those this part. Um, Layerwise relevance propagation, shortly termed LRP for feedforward neural networks, will be presented. I will talk briefly about what were the goals, although Professor Holziger has already explained in his lecture what were the goals and how it is applied, what are the results, the so-called heat maps, but also I will go deeper into detail in the mathematical basis of LRP. Um, graph neural networks um, will be one of the hottest topics and state-of-the-art topics in 
the application and conferences as we see. I will present the main ideas um, still learning in this field and I think this is still a work in progress but nevertheless it was included in the lecture because of its importance. Um, you will have a small bonus task where you will build a graph neural network. Expandable AI methods of graph neural networks are still in development and we will not put so much emphasis this year on that but we still encourage everyone to learn about graph neural networks. Um, the task will have one main part and one bonus part. The bonus part is the creation of graph neural networks and the main part will be split in two parts. The first one, you should uh, apply LRP on paper on a simple feedforward network and the second one will be to use the software that's developed by the Technical University of Berlin which is called Investigate in Python um, and to see for yourself what are the heat maps, what do the explanations produced by this um, software do. So let's talk briefly about fully connected neural networks. This is the simplest possible architecture and one of the first for supervised learning. Um, its simplest form is a classification. Let's assume that we have a set of images of cats and a set of images of cars and we want to train a feedforward uh, neural network um, to separate those two and classify those two correctly. So what do we see in this architecture? We see that we have one input layer and one output layer. Um, the images or any other input which can be numerically represented, it can be features like temperature, it can be um, also um, encoded um, categorical features like the size of um, uh, objects um, are inserted from the input layer and one can have as many hidden layers as one desires. Um, there are many layers, each layer containing a number of neurons denoted by circles. So each circle stands for a nonlinear activation function, which is applied to the input. Um, in this architecture, each neuron of each layer is connected with each one of the next, but each connection does not have the same weight. Um, not every input, let's assume in an image, has the same importance, doesn't play the same role for a prediction. Um, let's go back to the example of classification. The classifier can be trained on this data set of cats and cars, but to discriminate between cats and cars and say this is an image of a cat or this is an image of a car, um, and assuming the objects are centered properly and we don't have quality issues in our data set, um, this neural network should not put so much emphasis on the background of the images because they are in general not so significant for the differentiation between those two classes. So. What does the training procedure do? The training procedure specifies the weights and um, I repeat that there's a linear combination of the inputs weighted by the learned weight which is fed at each neuron and the linear, then the linear, uh, non-linear, sorry, activation function is applied. So in general the neural network computes overall a non-linear function f of x and um, for the sake and purposes of this lecture, let's assume that we go away from this classification scheme that I said before um, about separating between cars, images of cars and images of cats and let's assume that we have different uh, type of two classes differentiation and let's assume that we have a training set containing one type of object. Let's assume that this can be um, a cat or it's a building and other types of images that don't contain that object. And we can say that we want um, the output of the trained neural network to um, be zero when there's no object in the image and to be greater than zero if the object is recognized in the image with one particular degree of certainty that will be expressed by um, the uh, value of f of x. Um, 
the result of layer was relevance propagation when applied to a convolutional network that typically process images um, is going to be the, the heat maps that we've also seen in the lecture of Professor Holzinger. I will not go into details about the architecture of convolutional neural networks right now. I just want to focus on the resulting heat maps and how do we try as humans to interpret them. What do we see? First of all, let's see um, the, what the data set is firstly all about. Um, the, this neural network was trained on the MNIST data set, which classifies between handwritten digit images. So we have 10 classes from 0 to 9. So the neural network um, was trained on that. And after the training, we applied there was relevance propagation. And the heat maps show us what were the distinctive features of the images to discriminate between one class and the other. Uh, one example that one can observe uh, is that this zero is um, differentiated by its characteristic of having nothing in the, the, around the middle of the image, right? And it's very important to say that in case of classification, the parts that are highlighted, provided that we have a very good classification performance, is what discriminates one class images from the other class images. Meaning that if the data set is different and if the classes are different, then the heat maps may look different even if the architecture of the network is the same. The weights will be in general different and that's why we will have different heat maps. So those parts that are very very intense red are the parts of the image that helped the network to say this is one because um, we have here an edge that's very good recognizable and we don't see this characteristic in the rest of the images of the rest of the classes. Um, some terminology that's very important here, we say that the network is fully connected and we have a feed-forward calculation after the training, but the training itself um, and the back propagation that it's used to train the network uses the error of its prediction uh, with the training data to compute and learn the parameters, as we say. So what's happening is that the network is initialized with weights that are quasi-random, but in the training procedure we compare what does it predict and what it, with what it should predict according to the training data and then, um, at some time point, after many epochs, um, until the performance in a whole dot validation set of data that hasn't been, hasn't been used in the training set is sufficiently good, we stop the training procedure, the weights are frozen, and LRP is applied after the end of the training procedure. Now, unfortunately, the relevance propagation is going from the output layer to the input layer once. Um, and one shouldn't confuse the neural network training back propagation procedure where we have this feed forward backwards, feed forward backwards um, of the error with this LRP1 backward pass in the end of the training procedure, right? Um, one of the things that I also need to emphasize is that the training must have a good performance itself. So um, you as students and me also need to also think what uh, the heat map will look like if the performance of the neural network is not good. Can I trust this heat map? Um, is it good to follow um, the interpretations of the heat maps in such a case? And again, um, I can also show you this image, what I've uh, explained briefly before about the forward and the backward pass. Um, this neural network has this fully connected architecture and it's confronted with lots of images containing a cat and not containing a cat. And there are a lot of forwards and backward passes when um, this uh, network is trained. And in the end, we 
uh, after the training, these connections here have all their own individual weights. And after that, relevance propagation just makes one backward pass from the output to the heat map. And ideally, if the performance is very good, then we can see from the heat map that the background of this image didn't play a role for the classification of this image belonging to the class cat, but the characteristics of the cat itself was, um, were very um, descriptive for the neural network to take its decision properly. Uh, one other thing that will be used um, in the rest of the lecture is that usually one layer is indexed by the index E and the layer immediately after that is indexed by the index J. So this is just a convention. Let's proceed now to the basic mathematical principle behind LRP, which is actually the Taylor decomposition. So the Taylor expansion of a function f of x um, is known to everybody at a point a near to x is presented, uh, it's computed by this equation. Um, it uses the derivatives and the factorials of the function in this point A. And now the main idea of LRP was to take the classification output f of x of input x and forget about the higher order terms for the moment and put them all to um, a variable called epsilon and say, all right, if I have a root point, meaning in our case, an image x of tilde, um, and also rewrite the first derivative as um, the partial derivatives of um, x in the point x equal to x tilde, then I can, assuming that I have found a root point that has classification zero, so this f of x tilde is zero, then I can write the output of the neural network only composed by the first derivatives of its pixel. And in general, I can say that each output of the layer uh, j uh, with respect to the relevances can be also written um, by this formula where e is the index of the previous layer. So just setting this um, part as the relevance of each pixel computes, assuming that I have found the root point, uh, the relevance of each pixel in the image. And I can make this also iteratively going from the output layer to the previous layer and the previous layer before and come back to a heat map. So how does it that look in practical terms? In practical terms, we can think of one input containing a building and let's assume that the neural network um, classifies between images that contain the building and images that don't contain the building. And the main question is now, what is the root point in such a case and how can we find it? Now, if we add some noise in the input image or if we just occlude parts of the building that are, were very decisive or we expect that were very decisive for the neural network to acknowledge this input and classify this input as containing the building, then we have found a root point. An image that is very similar to the original one but is classified as not containing the building and has an output of f of x is zero. Now we can compute the gradient at this point, we can compute the difference with the original image and we can produce the heat map. This is certainly a simplified version, it is just for demonstration and learning purposes, but it shows the basic idea of what is going on and how the ideas of LRP were um, developed by the Theo Oberlin group. Um, and here is just another uh, um, presentation slide of what I said before of how to find the neighboring point. It seems to be quite easy, it's a bit more difficult than that, but nevertheless it's very important to know how in general one can do this. 
Now, LRP has also some very interesting properties, and one can refer to the paper for the derivation of these properties. There are two of them that we expect for you to use them in the task. Um, the, for every image and for every input, the uh, sum of relevances in a particular layer are equal to the sum of the relevances in another layer, so we don't lose any relevance from layer to layer, layer in general. And there's also the positivity um, property where we see that relevance is in general uh, greater or equal than zero. Uh, how can we use them? I mean, um, we can use them uh, since we, com we can compute the relevance for a small enough neural network, we can use them for testing or validation purposes for our computations. Either we do it on paper or we create a program computing them, we can use them to do a validation like a unit test. Um, one other very important component of the neural network that will be used also in the task is the rectified linear unit or ReLU. In short, it's um, a function that's used typically in the activation of the, of the neural network and it has the following form as you see in the image and it can be found in all commercial and non-commercial uh, neural network building software and libraries like TensorFlow, Keras, and PyTorch that we use in the institute. The example that will be used um, in the task for its solving uh, has a very, very small neural network composed just from one input, one hidden layer, and one output. Uh, this uh, part here denotes the ReLU function that I've shown you before and it shows that the activation function of the neurons in this hidden layer have this form. Um, all neurons in layer X are denoted by XI, all neurons in the network J, which is the hidden uh, layer, are presented with XJ and there's also the output neuron, which is just one and the functionality between the neurons in the hidden layer J is just a sampling, it's just the sum of all previous outputs from um, the all the neurons here. What's interesting in this image is that, um, unfortunately, for um, the purposes of depiction, the authors didn't connect each neuron with uh, of this layer with the neurons of this layer and all neurons of this layer with the neurons of the output layer. Um, please uh, don't be irritated by that and go back to page three and see that there are connections from each layer to other layer. We had also students um, being irritated by this image. So the connections are there. This is a fully connected network. It's just that we haven't designed every connection um, that it's possible in the image. Um, you can see the weights here and you will use them for computation purposes. And um, yes, that's all that I had to say here. Oh, the relative linearity is also written by this formula. The relevance of the output layer is, since we have a sampling functionality, is the sum of all the inputs of the previous layer. The relevance is then now backpropagated to the hidden layer J and the Taylor decomposition on the root point zero. And here we can also see from those equations and since the ReLU um, ensures that the root point will have a greater or equal than zero um, value, we know that this root point will have all its components equal to zero is given by this equation. And if you go back to the input layer, there is a derivation and a rule that has to be applied to go from the relevance of the hidden layer to the relevance of the input layer that uses the weights, as one can expect, of those um, for uh, the connections of um, the input layer to the forward layer. The derivation is unfortunately out of scope for the purposes of this lecture, but it can nevertheless be read in detail in the papers that are listed in the literature section. You only need to follow those um, equations to 
compute the results of the exercise. Now let's go to talk briefly about the bonus task and how graph neural networks work. So for those who know convolutional networks, they are applied on grid structured data. Mostly they are images, but not necessarily. One can also have structures of text that are presented in a grid structured form. Um, but the main idea of graph neural networks is that we have data that are not necessarily grid structured and we can process them. Um, the graph neural networks is composed by lots of numbers of layers, as we have seen in the fully connected case and as it holds also for uh, convolutional neural networks in general. There are T number of layers and it's very important that we shouldn't confuse T with time. We're not talking here about dynamical graphs. The graph's input components, nodes and edges, are represented by numerical features, um, which are, for example, in PyTorch uh, or in TensorFlow tensors, that are the input to the graph neural network. Um, each layer T transforms the features, so we have the first features inputted in the first layer and they are transformed until we reach this point here where we have H of T. And of course the graph neural networks has parameters that are learned, they're also presented with W as we've seen in the fully connected case. They are learned during training also called weights of the network, but should not be confused with the potential edge weights of the graph. Um, one important thing that I have to also say about graph neural networks is that edges and nodes can have, in general, different types of features. Um, and in that case, the graph is considered to be heterogeneous. In the other case, where every there's just one type of edge and one type of node features, we can talk about a homogeneous graph. And there are different training procedures for those two cases. Um, to specify the architecture of the graph neural network, we use also different operators which are presented by different adjacency matrices, and there are also different aggregation types for the embeddings of the nodes and the edges, which are usually sums. Uh, it can be also multiplications, and it's also um, a decision of the designer or th something that must be learned if one wants to work with graph neural networks. Here um, are the list of the things that I've said previously about graph neural networks. And uh, there is one um, Python library that we use in the institute now to learn about graph neural networks and create our own, which is called DGL. It's also written in Python and uses as a backend PyTorch, and PyTorch uses as a backend uh, TensorFlow or MXNet. And I'll just briefly talk about how to initialize those graph neural networks. And you can also see that here also one has input features, hidden features, aggregation types, and operations like convolutions, although they are completely differently defined for graphs. Also one potential forward method, which is very simple, stacks two layers one after the other, and you also see the use of the nonlinear activation function uh, relevant. Don't forget that DGL is still in development and try to um, things that are already in the tutorial. So graph neural networks LRP is quite similar uh, in principle with the things that I've shown you before about LRP in con fully connected neural networks. Um, the result of LRP is not a heat map right now. It's a collection of relevant walks on the input graph. It's just not presenting relevances of individual nodes and edges. And this is good in particular in applications um, where uh, the user sees relevance of the parts uh, of uh, the graph where one node is not just relevant because it's alone relevant, it's relevant because it's probably connected with another relevant node or because its edges are uh, particularly relevant and not separately, not individually. 
um, each block is assigned with a relevant score and their constraints as in the normal uh, and simple LRP case for the fully connected case uh, that uh, we have linear or well activation functions but there are no constraints about how the structure of the graph neural network uh, will be or the underlying graph. Um, one can validate that the model uses the graph structure meaningfully with those explanations, but the downside is that one has to search over many possible paths. One can imagine the graph can grow in size very quickly. So for one particular work, there's the length of the work order Taylor expansion, which is um, the one that's very similar to the LRP um, for fully connected neural networks. And the root point um, L tilde is very difficult to find, but it's shown in the paper that if the function of the output is relevant, then uh, we can use this um, L tilde is quite similar or as multiplication, small multiplication with some constant of the original lambda matrix that presents the, the adjacency matrix of the um, operations. And we can also simplify the Taylor expansions by that. The question is now what um, this adjacency matrix will look like and how will that make uh, sense and what does it represent, which is an ongoing work. And again, we have conservation properties um, to validate our results, but there's no exercise here because we need to also um, have the implementation to uh, work with that in a proper way. Now, let's go to the detailed description of the main task. The task contains two parts, as I said in the beginning. There's one numerical task where you use the equations that are presented above to compute numerically the relevance of all layers of the network depicted in the picture of, uh, in the figure of uh, page 11. And you can use your own weight values, but think on weighting schemes that are typically used in neural networks. Some students also used already uh, initializers so that they have learned from Keras and initialized the weights accordingly. Um, verify, please, that the conservation positivity rules properties apply to check the correctness of your results on paper. And it's very important that we as humans, that we can provide descriptions of those interpretations and we can see if the results do make sense or not, which is quite tricky. Um, the programmatic task uh, needs for you to install Python 3 plus and some relevant libraries to run the investigate library and provide, please, again, descriptions of the interpretations of relevance uh, images, the heat maps, with respect to the input images as well as their differences. The Python libraries that you will need for solving this task is the backends, which is, can be TensorFlow or MXNet. I personally tested it in TensorFlow. Keras is also a requirement and you can find in this GitHub of in the investigate uh, tool what um, are the versions that you can use in Keras and in TensorFlow to run this. Please run the code in the example sections. Put an image of your um, wish, which is also found in the example images folder. And then I'll tap the particular line to select a different analyzer and also see how different analyzers uh, change the influences of the resulting heat map appearance as well as the interpretation that you need to do. I strongly encourage the use of Python IDE uh, for better development, um, the PyCharm, but you can also send us uh, Jupyter notebooks if you want to. Um, for the bonus task, you can use the GDL library. This is also a Python library. Uh, installed it and run it in Linux, I've keen to see that there are problems uh, in Windows if one doesn't have all the DLL files of the Microsoft Visual Studio, which can be very uh, time consuming. But in Linux, I had no problems. I have run all the code and examples in Python 3.7. I used CUDA 10.2 and the QDNN 7.6.5 and I run the examples in TensorFlow GPU as my backend with Torch 1.6 and Torch Reason 
The DGL that I used is one of the latest for this particular CUDA version. So please just follow the steps presented in the tutorial, in the training section. This is chapter 5. I strongly encourage to also read and experiment with the previous chapters. Um, use one data set that is provided by the digital data, digital data set, or just create your own graphs and specific features and see what you can do. Don't forget to split the data set into training, validation, and test sets with the use of masks as they are defined in the examples of DGL. And you can create a simple GNN with a simple graph input that performs node edge classification or regression, link prediction or graph classification. Please beware, as the tutorial says, that if you do graph classification, you will usually need more than one uh, graphs in your data set to do this. In the literature, I encourage strongly for those who don't have a background in neural networks, the book of Duda and Hart, Pattern Classification. Uh, most things you will find in chapter 6, but of course I encourage you to also read the previous ones. It's free on GitHub and Christopher Bishops is also free for anyone who wants to learn not only just neural networks but also have a background in probability theory needed in machine learning, Bayesian networks and the fourth. Um, LRP is presented in very much detail in the work of Gregor Montavao explaining nonlinear classification decisions with deep tailor decomposition and for the bonus task I can also uh, show you four papers about how to explain graph neural network prediction, but first one needs to have practical experience in learning how graph neural networks work before one goes there. There are two books for those who are interested in graph neural network representations that I can provide uh, on demand, and but there is not one book that I can recommend or one source that I can recommend for graph neural networks since this is an ongoing topic. Thank you, and I will be happy to answer your questions. All right. So um, I realize now that uh... okay. Uh, so uh, th thank you, Anna and, and Andreas, for doing those for us. Um, I realized just now that uh, Anna sent me her bio that I completely didn't see, so I mangled her introduction. So I'm sorry about that. But I really like the the balance between the, the high level and the really low level. And I'm looking forward to seeing how this exercise three play, uh, plays out in practice. So with that, we've got a few more minutes for questions. So uh, would anyone be uh, uh, interested in asking one of their questions that came up on Discord or vice versa, Andreas and Anna, did you see any um, questions in Discord that you found particularly interesting. Let me have a quick look. Just a second. So where are we? So yeah, I find the comment very good you made. So I actually think, yeah, this is really very good. Yeah, maybe this Kubis, I don't know who is Kubis. Um, he says, so one of the things I continue to think about with regard to the human in loop is when to ignore the human. Actually, it's a really good fact because therefore I emphasize human in the loop can be beneficial sometimes, not always. So some, and, and for example, when I had, I was shocked, uh, this was seven or eight years ago when I gave a talk uh, at Carnegie Mellon and the people there said, Andreas, we are not interested in your approach of a human in the loop. We want to do it fully automatically. Press the button, wait for the results, blah, blah, blah. And I was shocked, but afterwards I realized that from the viewpoint of autonomous driving, automatic car driving, it makes sense because think of a drunken taxi driver 
this one single human can destroy your whole um, uh, autonomous driving facilities. So it really makes sense to sometimes to execute the human out of the loop. But in the medical domain, we have some other issues, social issues, ethical issues, legal issues. And there is the, this, this fear of AI responsibility. And uh, I think this is a really a, a, a point where the people are asking, the humans, the patients are asking for that a human should stay in control. Um, and, uh, and Matt, an interesting and really interesting uh, experience was, uh, I, have, I was invited to give a talk for a retired medical doctor. So there is at the medical university, there's such a, such a club for, for retired uh, doctors. And they wanted to have a talk about AI, machine learning, blah, blah, blah. And I was very frightened about that because I went in and I, I thought that I will now bombard it with oh, bullshit AI, blah, blah, blah. But the people there, the old people, 70 year old doctors with 50 years of experience, they said, this is great. For example, I was really ashamed myself with showing this 92%. They said, we wish to have 92%. This is super excellent. In by humans, you have 40%, 50%, you are lucky. Yeah. And uh, they said, they really, this was very interesting for me, a very interesting uh, experience that this elderly people who had possibly no contact with computers at all, uh, could envision that something could help them. For example, there's a lot of chimpanzee work. I have a good friend, he's a radiologist, and he always is asking me if there would be some tools who could take over the chimpanzee work, the easy task, because then he would be freed uh, for the more complex task, which no machines on this planet can solve. And he spends really much time with the complex task, but then he is tired with the easy task, you know? He is sitting six to eight hours in front of a screen and doing counting some, some stupid things. And uh, I think AI and, and to, 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 to think about what, what Kubi said is uh, really very good. Um, and I think in the future, uh, and this is in our profession, we must somehow um, find a combination of both so that we take, and this, this key, sounds now very populistic, but I think take the best of both worlds and put them together and you get more out of it, okay? But I, I think Anna would like to say something. I will not hinder her to talk. Anna is talking, but she is muted. Ah, Anna, unmute. All right. So I wouldn't want to add anything more about the answer of this question. I think Andreas put it puts it the best. So, but I, I do. But any I, other question? I, I do really like the idea, though, of figuring out where a human would be best, where a computer is best, and where the combination is the best. Um, one, one thing we were talking about recently also was what if you have a system that has some performance but is black box, and then you have another system with worse performance but is explainable? Mm -hmm. How do you figure out that trade off? And it sounds like with the, with the GDPR, it, it does need to have some explainability, but that's not necessarily full explainability. So maybe you just need to get over that, that, that hurdle, and then mm -hmm. anything that provides that small amount of explainability is fine. Yeah, no, the, 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 uh, the European uh, General Data Protection Regulation, the right for explainability is over, uh, often misunderstood, as I have mentioned before, because the right for explainability is a legal right. That means that everybody now has the, the, the legal right for asking why something uh, happened. And Rarely, if you are a patient and you are 100% satisfied, you are happy not to ask the, the, the medical doctor for any details. But if you get harmed, then you have to ask something. And, and I think this is in these in this rare cases of um, 
uh, difficulties than you have the right now to ask because this was not the case so dramatic it is this was not the case before for example the typical and and, and i think this is the best example you can give you get or you went to a bank you uh, ask for a loan and they said no we refused the loan yeah and then you said uh, why do i not get the money and they say because the computer said so and this is now forbidden okay now you have to explain what are the underlying criteria why they refuse the loan because of this 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 must be retraceable and the same is in the medical domain for example at in vienna at the hospital they have a beautiful retinal party autonomous machine but they cannot use it in routine they do it as a pre-screening okay uh, which helps them but they cannot rely on it because this is a black box algorithm and in case something happens and the medical doctor would rely on it he has a legal problem because he cannot say how this uh, on what criteria this was um, made the decision and therefore and, and the medical doctors have fear because uh, the legal rights in Europe are much stronger than maybe in the US uh, or in Canada and uh, this is this is affecting the people and therefore they have fear about that yeah um, here I can add something. Uh, first of all, from my experience from industry, uh, I've seen people, first of all, wanting 100% performance in any machine learning model that, that one provides them, any data science provides them. So, first of all, they care about performance. But the second part where explainability comes in is to sometimes debug the machine learning model, whatever it is. It can be a neural network or it can be a simple clustering. Uh, the question is, uh, why does this neural network has this kind of performance? It can be high, it can be smaller, it can be like around 90%. But it is very important to pinpoint exactly which part do contribute to a classification and which part somehow sabotage the classification so that we can make the prediction better. So, yes, we can have a great performance with uh, one particular network, but, but we cannot, how can we can get better with our performance without explainable AI and how can we verify that we will get better with more data, better quality, and so on and so forth. So, Awesome, thank you. Any other final questions? We've got a uh, little bit of time left. I had a question about the Kandinsky patterns for Andreas. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that is a test for explainability in particular. I'm not sure I quite understood that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the idea of the, so we were inspired by the Kandinsky patterns, the way how pathologists work, because we work a lot with medical doctors and particularly digital pathologists, our field. And I was inspired because uh, they really speak about geometric objects. So really they have round shapes, for example. So they are speaking about shapes. They are speaking uh, about architectures. They are speaking about regularities. They look for distances. So they really have these geometric objects. But the problem is, for example, when I ask a, a pathologist, uh, how do you know that this is correct? He says, mm, I know that. Yeah. From, and from where? Yeah, from, the, from the textbook. So they really, they compare with the textbook. So they have no underlying criteria. Yeah. And this then, uh, I'm, uh, we made the Kandinsky patterns because they are mathematically describable. So they, they imitate such, let's say, cells behavior, but they are at the same time uh, mathematically described. That means we have these ground truths, but we can take the ground truth now away. Now we can test a machine learning algorithm, okay, without showing them the ground truths, and then we can compare. Yeah, and most of the, uh, of the uh, let's say uh, of the idea is that we can, for example, look for explainabilities. But this is hard. 
Uh, Anna started with this uh, in the beginning, but this is very hard. Uh, for example, MIT, Stanford, all these people are working on this, you know, this getting explanations of describing images in, 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 in a kind of natural language. So this is really very difficult. Maybe Anna, you can explain something about this, your first experiences. <laughs> I've published a, a small survey about this, how constant learning is working. Uh -huh. well, yeah. And I'm still in the process of learning and we just work because we believe that graphs will uh, work better for our case. Hard. First of all, um, the Kandinsky patterns are not just an exploration environment, but also reminded me of by the data sets, like clever data set and clever data set, where a neural network is trained really to say that something is left from something else. Or we have a particular concept, like um, there are a lot of things uh, clustered in one area and the others surrounding them. So um, MIT really did a really good job there for the clever data set, um, which worked with a good performance and used symbolic AI methods, which are really hard to understand. Um, but the funny thing was that we expected that the generalization performance would be better, meaning that they've trained on those really distilled data sets um, like the Kandinsky patterns, but then they went on to, uh, with the same neural networks, to go and say, okay, we have images of Lego or um, um, games scenes that are really, um, one can see the pixels actually, and the performance was really low. So we decided to, first of all, experiment a little bit more with LRP and all explainable AI methods and also use graph neural networks for this task because mm -hmm. those networks are not enough for our purposes. Yeah, well, maybe I, I, can, uh, I can add for Reben, Reben McQueen, correct? Yeah. How, do I how do I pronounce it correctly? Reven McQueen. Yeah. Okay. So for you as an additional um, uh, as an additional information, at the same time these Kandinsky patterns are mathematically discovered. At the same time, they are visible for the human, so they are perceptible by the human. So that that means that we can contrast. We can, for example, the first idea was just to learn how humans describe such geometric objects. And we wanted to learn the concepts about that. And we are currently trying this with Birgit, Anna, uh, to, to set up in the pathological domain because there is no such things as pathological concepts. So we would benefit from a library uh, mm -hmm. which we can then use for training, for example, neural network. And it means that we could, uh, we could create an artificial pathology, okay? He learns concepts, yeah? And I was fascinated by this concept learning per se, but this is really, as Anna pointed out, this is cutting edge and very, very hard and very difficult. But with the Kandinsky patterns, I can show you, we have done some uh, free experiments. We have printed such booklets, yeah? And with these booklets, we can ask humans, for example. So humans can sit down and can then uh, try to describe, they can try to describe these objects, okay? So what do they see in the object? For example, I have shown this last year in, in Edmonton at the Exile Lab to the people. And here, this is a funny example, maybe. Uh, is it? Uh, uh, here is. So, so here, here you see. So here's a, a certain Kandinsky pattern. This has a concept behind it, yeah. And I gave a hint, yeah, to the Canadian friends, yeah. Uh, and I said this has something to do with America, yeah. And Randy said center of the earth. <laughs> And uh, yeah, because you see a sun here, yeah, in the middle, and but you see also some blue shape uh, like ears, okay? And you see there's always this figure, I pointed out here, 
So you see here, you see the yellow shape, it's like a sun, and you see these blue ears, and this is the concept of Mickey Mouse. So this is really the, the logo of Disney, Mickey Mouse, yeah? But this is only describable for somebody who knows that this is Disney, okay? So this is the Disney logo. And um, this was interesting uh, that uh, only people who know this concept can explain this, okay? Others do not see that. Yeah, I was, I my was wife, so for sure. example, she's mad in Mickey Mouse. She immediately said, "This is Mickey Mouse." Okay, without any second of thinking. I was so sure it was going to be an orange circle, and it was going to be about Trump. Um, <laughs> but th I, I, so, to be respectful of everyone's time, I think we should cut off here. But as always, if people want to hang out, um, uh, we'll turn off the recording uh, and and hang out for a little bit. But. Anna and, and Andreas, thank you so much for spending time with us. I know it's it's nighttime for you, but you were still able to come and teach us some awesome stuff. And I look forward to uh, being able to buy you guys some beer next time you are in, in uh, Edmonton. Yes, yes, I, we're looking forward. So Anna and me will sure come to Canada. Anna is looking forward. So I can finance a, a longer stay of her in Edmonton. Uh, with our friends and yeah, yeah, and I would be happy if we can co cooperate and work together, Matt. Yeah, it awesome. was nice, pleasure. And to all colleagues uh, out there, thank you for listening. And if you have any further questions, just drop a mail. You know, we don't get any mails, so we are happy to receive mails. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Okay, bye bye then.